Hi, I'm Nancy Blotner. At Caldwell University, we believe that all citizens should be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Caldwell University, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Virtua, Qualcare Inc., a managed care company administrating health plans that care about your health care. Verizon, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. And by Observer New Jersey Politics. I'm Steve Adubato, or you know that because you saw the introduction of the show, but more importantly, I'm pleased to uh, welcome once again our good friend Michelle Sikirka, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer uh, of New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Michelle, for those who don't know, describe uh, NJBIA. We are the voice for business <clears throat> in the state of New Jersey. Um, every day we're out advocating for a good business climate in the state of New Jersey, making sure that businesses can grow, thrive, survive, create new jobs. And to that end, um, this publication, New Jersey Business, is your publication. Yes. Um, we happen to cross-promote in there as well. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the fact that um, there is a report that's out. Um, uh, not really a report, but you had a summit. Yes. On um, what day? So September 18th, um, Opportunity New Jersey is an organization that I co-chair with Tom Bracken of the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce. Right. Uh, we've had this organization for almost two years now, and we hosted a summit because we need to set an agenda for affordability in the state of New Jersey. We are in a situation right now in the state of New Jersey where regardless of if I'm talking about a small business, a taxpayer, a parent who has a kid going off to college next year, affordability rings true to you because New Jersey is no longer affordable. So we're actually taping this program right before the gubernatorial election. Um, either he or she will be the governor of this state. What should he or she be focused on? We need to have an honest discussion of how and why New Jersey became unaffordable how we lost our competitive edge to our two border states, Pennsylvania and New York, who honestly are our number one and number two out-migration states for New Jersey residents. We're losing Population to them. and money. To them, yes, absolutely. Over, absolutely, Steve. Over the last 13 years, New Jersey has lost a net adjusted gross income, $21 billion, out of the state of New Jersey, the number one and number two out-migration state, Pennsylvania, New York are two border states. We are not regionally competitive, and we've gotten to a tipping point where New Jerseyans just feel that New Jersey is no longer affordable. So we proactively are saying we need an agenda for affordability in the state of New Jersey. And give me a couple of the solutions or recommendations the summit came up with. Well, we focus in four areas. Um, so taxation. We need to look at why are property taxes what they are? How do we fund education in the state of New Jersey, which drives over 85% of property tax, depending upon right. where you live, okay? But that's what's driving it. We need to have an honest discussion of with the cost of funding education in the state of New Jersey. It's great that we're number one in the nation in our K-12, but when we're costing over 19,000 per pupil per year times 13 years, and then and then exporting half those students outside the state of New Jersey. Maybe we lose them after they graduate. When they choose to go on to four-year traditional higher ed, almost half of them go out of the state of New Jersey to do it. After that investment. We're not keeping them here. We are not keeping them and here. And very often they don't wind up coming back home to Correct. do what they do professionally. Correct, correct. And then those that stay here are significantly challenged in affording to live here and create independence. You know, the number two statistic is we are number one in the nation for millennials living at home with their parents. That tells you we lack affordability for millennials in the state of New Jersey. What do we need to do? Well, we talked about taxes. The next well, thing we... I want to be clear. Yes. You got income taxes. You got sales tax. You got property taxes. Corporate business tax. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that taxes should be cut across the board? What I'm saying is that we need to ensure that we have regional competitiveness in the cost. And embedded in that is the taxes in the state of New Jersey, because they drive a lot of the lack of affordability in the state of New Jersey. Devil's advocate. And, 
When we interviewed both candidates for governor, again, one of whom will be the governor, um, the issue of the pension crisis in the state, the public employee pension crisis yes. comes up. And so it's, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, maybe $80 billion in a hole in yeah. terms of the unfunded liability. The point here is, so you ask the question, where's the money going to come from? And some say you raise taxes on the wealthiest people in the state <laughs> to fund the public employee pension crisis so that you can pay those who are public employees are going to retire at some point. And you're sitting there going, no, 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 no. You can't because... Because I just gave you a statistic of the affluence that we left, that left the state of New Jersey and that we lost. If we had $21 billion that stayed in the state of New Jersey into our general fund that we could use to fund our safety net programs, our pension, our education, you know, we, talk, we hear talk of a millionaire's tax. Who do you think's leaving the state of New Jersey? We should be proud that we have millionaires. We should want to make millionaires every day in the state of New Jersey, not just make them, keep them. We have individuals every day who increase their affluence in this state. They come here, they work here. We have great paying jobs in the state of New Jersey. We have a highly skilled workforce. And then we let them leave. And they accumulate this wealth, and they take it to another economy, and they spend it. And we lose the spending power. So here's my question. Again, we're in an interesting spot because we want to talk big picture with Michelle. But one of these two candidates um, will be the governor of the state. Say the governor of the state has a publicly stated philosophy of taxing millionaires more. How would the New Jersey Business Industry Association engage that governor? Mm -hmm. Well, where we start is that a millionaire's tax is a tax on small business. How so? Because when you have businesses that are S-Corps, even some LLCs, their tax returns... A limited liability corporation or an S-Corp yes. is a federal tax... Uh, identification, status, exactly. yeah, status, go ahead. So what happens is when they do their taxes every year, their tax return, their business income flows through their individual return. So now you have a business owner, small business S-Corp, okay, the money they make through their business flows through their individual return. So they may look like they're a millionaire, but that's a small business owner. That's their business money coming in. And they're taking that money and putting it back into their business. Right. They're not going out and buying a yacht with it. They're putting it back in their business. They're creating jobs with that money. That money is at risk when we do that. So now some out there will say, no, it's really the millionaires. And then I come back and I say, okay, every time a millionaire leaves the state of New Jersey, we lose the ability to tax their money. We just fought for elimination of a state tax. Tell right? everybody, yeah, because New Jersey is, uh, uh, actually I was doing one of the forums I was moderating for you and your colleagues at Business Industry Association dealt with this issue. Mm -hmm. And it was a long going conversation that New Jersey was the most expensive state in the nation to die in. Absolutely. Two taxes explain the double taxation? Well, we, we had we had a state tax at a threshold of $675,000 plus and inheritance tax. The inheritance tax. Exactly. So now if you think about what $675,000 was, that could be a house and a, and a pension in the state of New Jersey, expensive state, okay? That's not a millionaire. That's not a millionaire in the state of New Jersey. So what we successfully did is we advocated for elimination of the estate tax so that we could be competitive with that number one and number two out migration state. Pennsylvania has no estate tax whatsoever. That's why New Jerseyans moved in the past to Pennsylvania mm. to avoid estate tax. January 1 of 2018, the estate tax goes away forever in the state of New Jersey. We need to preserve that. Now, why is that so important relative to millionaire's tax? Because the CPA Society, our friends at the CPA Society tell us this year, as they're counseling their wealthy clients, they're saying, guess what? You don't have to run out of the state of New Jersey because the estate tax will be eliminated. And if you were leaving for that reason, you can now stay. But now you know what they're going to have to say? Oh, but by the way, we're going to increase and have a millionaire's tax and tax you over 10 percent on a million dollars. So a few seconds left. Anytime people say, you know what? You got to go after the money from those who have the most you're saying it's not so black and white. Because when they leave the state of New Jersey, we have no money to go after. Um, Michelle Sikirka is the president and the chief executive officer of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Been around for a couple of years, it's been around? Three years. Now, you've been around for three years. They've been around. Oh, my gosh. They've been around for 107 years. Is that really right? 107 years. And this publication, New Jersey Business, check it out. I learn every month in this publication. You should as well. Michelle, I want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Pleasure as always, Steve. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. 
Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Welcome to uh, the Help for Our Heroes series. We're doing a series of interviews with advocates and uh, experts and people in the government and people in the foundation community who mm -hmm. care deeply about our veterans. We're here at the Healthcare Foundation in New Jersey and we're pleased to welcome back once again to our broadcast, um, Elaine Katz, who is Senior Vice President of Grants and Communications at Kessler Foundation. Thank you for joining us, Elaine. Thank you, Steve, for having me. Kessler Foundation cares deeply about the needs of veterans because? Because they're a population that's often overlooked and unemployed, uh, returning from uh, different Gulf Wars and other situations, um, and they just simply can't find employment. They, it, it's very difficult, right? It's very difficult to find employment. There's a lot of other issues surrounding them. It's not just getting the job. It's all those wraparound services that make it so critical to help somebody um, like a veteran become employed. You use the term wraparound services. Could you break that down a little bit? So wraparound services, when you, when you get a job, um, you go to work every day and you go home every day um, and you do your job. But if you don't have a home to go to and you may be homeless or you don't have a support system or you don't have the funds to buy even clothes or you're coming back with other issues that interfere with personal family relationships, it's very difficult to get and maintain a job. Disabled veterans, I don't know if I want to even use that term, veterans who are dealing with serious issues head injuries, others. The Kessler Foundation deals with that as well. And I know there are scientists on your team we've talked to extensively about that. But those injuries have a great impact on the quality of life of many of these veterans and their family members, right? Correct. So if you're coming back, a returning veteran, and you have cognitive issues with memory, you have traumatic brain injury, you may have spinal cord injury, you have other disabilities um, that affect your quality of life and interfere with everyday life, doing everyday tasks, it's very difficult to go out in the community and find a, and maintain a job. Um, you, so you have employers that say, yes, I want to hire a veteran. But when it comes down to the fact, some of them are very scared. Um, scared of? Scared of uh, reactions in the workplace. Place. Um, somebody may not be able to handle the job because of um, being labeled or, or self-identifying as having post-traumatic stress injury. Um, it's very frightening to employer to not know what may happen to that employee in the work environment. And we know typically that those individuals with the right supports can do very well and integrate completely into the workforce and the community. One of the things I've learned about Kessler Foundation over the years, because to disclose, the foundation has been supportive of some of our programming in the past is that you're very supportive of organizations, corporations who do hire vets. Correct. In New Jersey, we've given uh, two grants to the GI Go Fund in Newark, New Jersey. And the first one actually supported a uh, customer service training initiative. Um, what they did was hire uh, vets. They, in fact, there was a homeless veteran that went through the program. And because of the GI Go Fund's uh, relationship they built through this program with a uh, a corporate partner, PSENG. The person was hired. They PSENG has been a great partner with the GI Go Fund. Uh, during Hurricane Sandy, they hired many of these trainees to work their customer service centers uh, because they needed staffing uh, to help with all the calls they were getting in response to their emergency. So uh, the GI Go Fund has been a wonderful partner. They recently also started a job training center, which we help fund. Um, that provides these wraparound services, as, you, right. as we call them. Um, so they're helping uh, homeless veterans find their homes. They're helping them um, learn banking, all the other skills. skills. And the most important one with their training vet is translating those military leadership skills, management skills they've learned into everyday layman's terms that will make sense to a private employer. It's interesting, Elaine mentions the GI Go Fund, fund their executive director, Jack Fanus, is uh, with us. We're, we're having a round table in just a few minutes of 12, as I said, experts, advocates, foundation uh, leaders, folks in the government community, and Jack, who is with the GI Go Fund. By the way, can we make sure I know our executive producer, John Eichlin, will have the GI Go Fund up throughout this interview that Elaine was talking about. That organization is one of the many that are out there every day trying to make a difference. It, last question for you. Is it fair to say, Elaine, that one of the challenges for veterans and their family members is that there are so many different organizations, there are so many government agencies, there are so many different places where you could get help, but navigating that is not easy? I think navigating that for a person with a disability, whether they're a veteran 
or they're just a member of the general community, it's very difficult to know where to get services. We're very fortunate in New Jersey that there are many agencies to go to that serve veterans. I know you're going to be interviewing some of them. There's also the My VA group in New Jersey. What is it? Uh, it's called My VA. Um, the Veterans um, Hospital Network has started a veterans group in every single state, which also the GI Go Fund, Jack Fanus is chair of that group. Uh, that provides help and assistance to uh, veterans navigating some of the health care issues they may have. So there is a lot of assistance. The question is, um, there's not one portal that you can really go to um, or that veterans really want to go to to get help. Sometimes just identifying the fact that they need help is very difficult for somebody who's been proud, determined, and served our country well. So finally, the last thing you said, that because veterans are so self-sufficient or see themselves that way, mm -hmm. That's one of the obstacles to reaching out. Correct. Um, they've been learned um, through their military training to be self-sufficient, right. to be determined, um, to help out in a crisis, and sometimes recognizing that they're in crisis is just very difficult. But I think um, as you as you talk to people in this series, you know, identifying that there's a need is very, very important, and it's the first step to getting help and really successfully integrating in the community when there's been an issue. I mean, cats. Kessler Foundation, making a difference every day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Mr. Marty Johnson, who is the founder and president of a great organization called Isles Inc., founded in 1981, with the purpose of? It's a nonprofit community development organization focused on environmental solutions. It's based in Trenton, trying to come up with innovative ways to meet a nine word mission, which is foster self reliant families in healthy, sustainable communities. So that is an interesting way of approaching some of these challenges that we face in tougher communities. Back in, uh, back in the day, 1989, Marty and I were in the second class of a great organization called Leadership. New Jersey, I met you then, and I thought, the tremendous passion that you had and have today mm. to help people. Where does that come from? So that's a really good question. I go back to my grandparents who moved up from the South. They were sharecroppers. They wanted to work in the rubber factories of Akron, Ohio, and uh, struggled. They ultimately found a job there. My parents grew up in those families and had a, a pretty challenging time. My mother was in an accident when I was young. She couldn't walk a good chunk of my childhood. My father ended up leaving after when I turned 16. Little brother and sister at home, mother in a difficult body cast. And, uh, you know, the football coaches from Princeton University come to my high school. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to be a high school kid and dealing with those challenges that come with being, uh, with having those deep questions about, you know, where's food, where's housing right. come from um, for us as a family, and uh, darned if I didn't get in. So you I got thrown Princeton. in the middle of Princeton's campus as a football player. And you actually wrote your, was it your senior thesis? Yeah, I sure did. I wrote a senior, I, I was able to visit Northeast Brazil my half, second half of my junior year, to be, and I looked at some challenges of a development in a fishing village there, and it got me thinking a lot about aren't there better ways of doing development in places that need it? that would both strengthen those that you intend to serve there in those communities as well as the environment. And out of that, I wrote a senior thesis on that project, but started looking at, okay, if you were to do this better, what would it look like? And me and a couple of others decided to take that theory and, and put it into Isles. practice. We created Isles when I was a senior, and uh, I've never had a real job, Steve. I hear you, but you work at it every day. Fast forward, weatherization of homes is a big piece of this because yeah. we talked to our friends over at PSEG and I know they're a part of this as well. Make that connection for us in terms of um, energy efficiency slash weatherization of homes. So the largest line item in a family's budget is their housing, and that includes the utility bill, right? And so we have thousands of homes in these neighborhoods that we're looking at, Trenton, Newark, Camden, elsewhere, thousands of homes that haven't seen even the first generation of energy upgrades. That's a travesty, because not only are we heating the out the sidewalks during the winter time, but these families are paying enormous amounts of money for this. So it's costing lots of us taxpayers, those families, money for that to happen. And of course, if you care about climate change, this is a classic example of stuff that you can do to save energy. And so PSENG is in this interesting position of both selling energy and saving energy, right? 
we're going to be hearing more about that over this right. coming year and the implications of maybe decoupling those incentives. But they began about 10 years ago, a more intensive look at ways to save energy. And we had been involved in that uh, as well. And so they came to us and said, is there a way for us to partner? And so we uh, helped them get access to households in Trenton, um, which is sometimes hard for them to do. We also um, began doing retrofits of homes, weatherization. What's it cost for the families? What does the utility cost? No, no, no. What does it cost for these families to get this done? Well, it uh, depends. If they're very low-income families, it costs them nothing. Nothing? Nothing. If they're moderate-income families, they're, it costs them a percentage of the total cost the to of pay. that. Yeah. It's based on the ability to pay. The long-term savings are enormous, right? So it's well in everyone's interest for there to be more and more of that kind of work being done. But as you can imagine, these are challenging neighborhoods. Most contractors don't want to go into those neighborhoods. They don't want to be knocking on the doors. They don't want to be doing the assessment, that type of thing. What we found, though, is, and I, I, uh, I think this is important, what we found, though, as we were doing this other work, like community gardening work, is that the issue of lead yeah, let's kept talk about coming the, in yeah, the, What does to lead the mix, have to do with... Right? And so that's yeah. the question, is what does lead have to do with energy? That's right. Well, what we started to... As we started doing community gardening, you got to get good at looking at the lead because the background soil in places like Trenton, probably 60% of it probably is contaminated. So we're doing raised bed, bringing in clean soil so you can you know, grow your longest carrot. As we got good at that, the state came to us and said, the state DEP. And the said, Department of Environmental Protection it came to, went to Isles? Protection came to Isles and said, this is about 15 years after we started doing the urban ag work. And they said, we know you guys are... Urban agriculture. Urban agriculture. We know you guys are doing this work on these contaminated sites. We know you're not coming to us for permission, but we think it's pretty interesting. How about looking at brownfield sites, the larger industrial sites? There were about 100 of them in Trenton alone, which had been contaminated and abandoned. And so, you know, after a while, we finally said, yeah, I guess we can take a look at that. It was a little well, scary. So, what, uh, Sorry for cutting you off, Marty. Help us understand what the impact has been of those efforts. So uh, good organizations learn. So we were told to take a look at these four sites, ways to involve the community in that process. Maybe if we brought people together, we could find ways to both protect kids who were playing on those sites, as well as get them on the radar screen and cleaned up, redeveloped. That's the long-term hope. What we, kept, what we found, though, is as we brought experts in, the mothers would say, in particular, what's been the impact of that site on my child? Yeah, what happens to those children? What is the impact? And you know what the experts said? We don't know. No, they didn't say we don't know. Well, they said we don't know. It depends on how much the kid has been playing over here versus over here versus over there. And so that was not a very acceptable answer, right? And so we started thinking we got to do a better assessment here. We were seeing this data that these kids were having health outcomes that were just not, not good, right? And so what we started doing is going from the brownfield sites into the surrounding neighborhoods and doing testing, backyards, inside the homes. What and, were we finding? And what we were finding was like shocking. We're looking at some photos of it. Right? It was shocking. High what levels. we were finding is that over 65% of the homes that we were testing shouldn't have been lived in by children. The dust in the homes, it is, it's about a half a pack of sugar, you know, from your restaurant sugar packs, about a half a pack of sugars with the lead will permanently damage a child. Permanently. And so what's in going on is that, well, it impacts their brain. Respiratory right? system. So it's, it's your cognitive functions, it's impulse control and the behavioral front. The challenge of lead is that the researchers don't know really what's going to happen. They don't know whether that impact is going to be five years down the road, ten years down the road. What we do know is that prisons are full of inmates who've got, if you drill into their bone marrow, there's a lot of lead. So that it has right, enormous impact. So we've got about a minute left. Real quick, uh, what's, being, what's being done in that regard? The important thing is that not only do we know more about this problem now, we figured out low-cost ways to go into these homes and weatherize the home at the same time we're doing the retrofits for lead. And that's the key. Isles has been around since 1981. As I said before, I've known Marty uh, as classmates back in 89 in Leadership New Jersey. And it's not just your passion, but your commitment to make a difference in the lives of other people, particularly, particularly those who too often are forgotten. It's just incredibly impressive. And we honor you for your efforts. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Steve. Well done. Yeah, appreciate it.
The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Caldwell University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Virtua, Qualcare Inc., Verizon, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. At Virtua, we don't cut the quad tendon for knee replacement so you don't have to cut anything you love to do. It's what we don't cut that counts. The Virtua Joint Replacement Institute. Visit gotmylifeback.org today.